Thanks to the Keweenaw National Historical Park Advisory Commission for supporting this video. Hey there, welcome to Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula. You see that facility across the water? I have noticed it every time I've been through this area. And recently I learned that it is way more significant and fascinating than I could have ever guessed. On the surface, this place turned raw copper from the local mines into usable, marketable products. Things like copper cakes and ingots. But they were also helping to electrify the United States because those copper products were then turned into things like wires that brought electricity to many people for the first time. Today, that facility is the last of its kind in the world. And I got a chance to go inside. So, welcome to the Quincy Smelter. Here's the story and the science behind how this place helped transform the modern United States. So from about the mid 1800s to the 1970s, copper was a huge deal in this part of Michigan. There was a lot of it. It was among the purest copper in the world and the mining industry completely transformed this place. If you wanna learn more about what happened in one of those copper mines specifically, I just wrapped up a mini series on the Quincy mine, which I'll link to up here. Now, during that century or so, various mines built mills to process their copper bearing rock. Then whatever unused rock they had left over was just discarded somewhere out of the way, often in a nearby body of water. That's what happened here on Portage Lake. By the time the 1890s rolled around, there was a ton of discarded stamp sand piled up here. But for the Quincy Mining Company, that ended up being incredibly convenient. This company already had a successful copper mining operation, but now they were in the market to build a smelter to process their ore. And all this discarded stamp sand was basically new waterfront property. So in the 1890s, they acquired this place, leveled everything out, and boom, they had the perfect location for a smelting facility right on the water. Side note, if you know anything about stamp sands already, you might know that they've caused a ton of environmental damage in this part of Michigan. But here I do want to note that this ground in particular is not dangerous to spend time on. The stamp sands at Quincy Smelting Works were never treated with harsh chemicals, so as long as you don't like eat the sand, you'll be fine. That's it. The goal of this place was to melt down something called mineral copper, which kind of looked like copper sand, and turn it into marketable products like cakes and ingots that could be shipped all around the country. Then those products could be turned into things like wires to bring electricity to homes and businesses, used for brass furnishing, along with basically anything else you could think to make with copper. And overall, it was hugely successful. By the time this facility closed in 1971, it had processed nearly one billion pounds of copper. These days, the facility is owned by the Keweenaw National Historical Park Advisory Commission, and along with their partner, the Quincy Mine Hoist Association, it's open for tours. So if you're ever in the area in the summer, you can stop by and get the story of most of the buildings in this place and what exactly happened in each one. But for this video, what I wanna focus on is the science and engineering. Like how do you turn mineral copper into something usable and marketable? And also why is this place in particular so special? Because if you do a quick search, you'll find it called the only remaining industrial site of its type left in the world. So, what does that mean? Well, let's head inside. I'll show you around and also share what I learned. Welcome to the Mineral House. This was the first stop for material coming to the Quincy Smelter. Here, train cars filled with mineral sand came over from the nearby Quincy Stamp Mill over on Torch Lake, where some initial filtering and processing had been done. When the train cars came in, somebody would pull this lever and the chute would open and the mineral copper flowed into carts. Then with the help of tram tracks, the carts were pushed over to the reverberatory furnace building where a lot of the magic happened. Now, I am not a cart, so I'm gonna go out the way I came in and take the long way around. So smelting is all about taking ore and extracting the pure metal from it. And people have been doing this for thousands of years. Conveniently though, since the copper in the Keweenaw Peninsula was among the purest on earth, smelting involved a lot of just regular melting. There were some impurities that you needed to remove, but not as many as in other places. Still, this process involved a lot more than just heating up some rock. Like at one point, you also had to dunk some trees in molten metal, but, We'll get to that. Okay, welcome to the reverberatory furnace building. 
So originally, there were four furnaces in this room, one in each corner. Today, you can still see one of those furnaces, but let's head over to furnace number five in the other room here. So before I started this project, I thought that smelting involved taking some rock, throwing it into some kind of crucible, sealing the whole thing up, and then throwing that in a fire. And that is a technique that exists, but it's not what they used here. Quincy Smelting Works used a process called reverberatory smelting. They weren't the first to come up with it, but it did work remarkably well here. So with this process, they put mineral copper in one side of the furnace and coal in another. They were separated by a low wall. The coal was burned and the heat reverberated through the wall and over the top of the copper, rather than heating it from underneath. So for the most part, the copper was never directly exposed to flame. It was melted with an indirect heat. Then workers could scoop or skim the waste called slag off the top of the molten metal, and the slag was put into carts, which were then wheeled away to another part of the facility for further processing. What I think is the most interesting part of this process, though, is something called raveling. Here, workers would take an iron paddle called a rabble and mix up the molten metal to get some air into it. Among other things, one of the goals was for that air to oxidize any impurities left in the metal so that they would separate from the bulk of the copper and could just be skimmed off the surface. The trouble was, raveling still left some excess oxygen in the mix, which could contaminate the metal or reduce its strength. So to get that out, they took a green hardwood pole and dunked it into the molten copper, basically a tree. The pole caught fire immediately because like copper doesn't melt until it reaches nearly 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And when this pole caught fire, it released a bunch of carbon. That carbon reacted with any excess oxygen left in the mix to form carbon dioxide gas, which then left the copper bath and floated out of the furnace. It was such a clever idea. With the older furnaces, this pure molten copper was then hand ladled into molds. But here, I want to talk about what happened at this furnace because it involved a pretty incredible piece of technology. So once the raveling process was over, the copper was released from this furnace, or tapped, in a way that modern day OSHA would absolutely not approve of. Somebody stood behind this wall with a hammer and they straddled a channel tapped a brick out and just watched the molten copper flow between their legs like the world's most dangerous game of croquet. After that, the copper flowed into a mold held by this spidery thing called the Walker casting machine or Walker casting wheel. It was installed in 1920 and overall, has a pretty simple, elegant design. Each of these arms held a mold, maybe something to make copper bars for wires, or cakes for copper sheets, or ingots. The operator sat in the middle and used those long arms to control the machine's rotation, along with a pouring ladle at the mouth of the furnace. So the copper flowed into a mold, was sprayed with water to solidify it, and then traveled around to a pool of water in this deeper area for further cooling. Then this conveyor hauled the molds and their contents away, ultimately to the warehouse to wait for shipping. Now, this process was efficient, but some copper still ended up in the slag created in these furnaces. And like, you know the Quincy Mining Company was not going to let that copper go to waste. In fact, there is a whole building dedicated to getting it out. It's called the Cupola Building. Over here, we've got a vertical furnace that used direct heat rather than the reverberatory heat used next door. In this building, coal, slag, and a bit of limestone were all loaded into the top of the furnace. The slag melted, and that last bit of copper drifted down to the bottom where it could be tapped out. After that, the remaining molten slag was taken outside, and uh, well, let's just say there are some significant solidified slag piles on site here. Besides the whole engineering process, one thing that really impressed me about this place was just how self-sufficient it was. I mean, not only did they have all of these furnaces and receiving buildings, but they also generated their own electricity using steam engines and even had a lab where chemists could learn how to improve the smelting process. And then, of course, they also had this dock, or what used to be a dock, where ships could come in, pick up the metal, and carry it all over the country. Now, by the time the 1970s rolled around, things weren't going great here. Activity was relatively low, and Quincy Smelting Works was also facing new environmental directives from the state. So in 1971, they hung up the keys and just left. 
After that, the facility switched hands a couple of times and was most recently acquired by the Keweenaw National Historical Park Advisory Commission. Their intent is to gift it to the Keweenaw National Historical Park, but these things take time. So the commission is working to maintain the buildings and make sure this place is a safe environment for visitors. They're also working with the community and the park service to figure out an appropriate future for this facility. Because overall, this really is a special one of a kind place. You won't find another historical reverberatory smelting facility like this in the world. And you won't find another early 1900s copper smelter in the United States. From the mineral house all the way to the locker room that hasn't been touched in 50 years, this place is a piece of U.S. history. It's a major reason why many homes and businesses got electricity in the 20th century, and it's also a monument to the workers, chemists, and engineers who made that happen. Because yeah, this place is an engineering marvel, but it's also a very human place full of very human stories. And after walking past it a dozen times, I'm glad I finally got to learn why it exists. If you'd like to learn more about Quincy Smelting Works, I highly recommend scheduling a visit or stopping by for a tour in the summer. There is just so much more to this story than I could fit in a video, and a lot of it is best experienced on site. To schedule a tour, you can contact the Quincy Mine Hoist Association at quincymine.com about, or you can give them a call at this phone number. I will include both of those in the description below. And finally, a huge thanks to the Keweenaw National Historical Park Advisory Commission for supporting this video. If you want to learn more about the National Park, you can visit this URL, which I'll also include in the description. And if you'd like to donate to the preservation of the Quincy Smelter, you can do so at coppercountrypreservation.org. Thanks as always for joining, and I'll see you soon.